Claudia, are you here? I am here, Joran. Thank Hello. you. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Hello, and welcome to everyone. It is wonderful to have you all on with us this evening as we talk about starting a, a spiritual community from scratch. What I'd like to do first is just um, presence us in this space um, by just doing a short meditation prayer with you all. And uh, then I'll go into a little bit of the, um, the, the code of conduct, so to speak, um, for uh, these calls. So let's, uh, let's just start out by, by being present, by taking a nice deep breath and just allowing all the thoughts and all the worries from today just float away with your exhale and inhaling once more nice and deeply into your heart space and then exhaling feeling your tension leaving your body coming into this sacred space the presence of now building the sacred space together holding the light of the, each other's hearts within our own, feeling the energy as it flows through us and around us, even though we're not physically together, our energies within this sacred place connect and light each other up. In your mind's eye, imagine us in a circle, looking into each other's eyes, holding the space for our authenticity, our wisdom, our love, to come into the circle. Divine One, we are grateful for this opportunity to come together as ministers, to be together as ministers, to get support and give support as interfaith, interspiritual ministers. And so it is. Amen. All right. Thank you, Claudia. And uh, once again, hello and welcome, everybody, uh, for being here tonight. I know that you have so much going on and so many other places you can be, uh, including watching the GOP debate tonight uh, could be one of those places you could be. And so we're very appreciative of you choosing uh, to be here with us. Uh, what we are doing tonight is we're talking about growing a spiritual community from scratch. So that is uh, what a few of us have done as interfaith ministers, as chaplains, uh, as leaders within our community, as community builders, we've started these spiritual communities, either interfaith or interspiritual communities, uh, kind of from the ground up. And so these things could start as small groups, as regular meetings, as home churches, and uh, they grow from there. And so what we're interested in tonight is discussing how these start, uh, how they grow, and maybe some best practices on how we can help them grow and what tools we're using, either facilitation tools or technological tools uh, to grow these communities and help get the word out about them uh, into the cities or the markets surrounding us uh, that uh, are hopefully uh, seeking 
uh, the kind of community that we're building. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for being here tonight. Uh, this uh, topic is near and dear to my heart. I'll introduce uh, myself and tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Joran Oppel, and I am uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida. I am the uh, minister at the Integral Church of St. Petersburg, a newly formed church we uh, started around three years ago. I'm also uh, a member of the St. Petersburg Interfaith Association, uh, an ambassador for the Parliament of the World's Religions, and I was also, uh, for two years, uh, I was a, a, a prayer chaplain at a Unity Church uh, here in St. Petersburg as well. So I think it was Donna who said she's the licensed Unity teacher. Uh, you and I will have that in common. The, um, the thing I want to kind of start off with is just a story about how we started Integral Church. I, and it's interesting because when I went through the chaplaincy, I definitely had a choice. Uh, I was facing a crossroads in my life of whether to enter uh, ministry through unity uh, or blaze my own trail, so to speak. And it was uh, pretty clear uh, to me that while I had a, a deep and uh, reverential and a daily uh, relationship with Christ, it was not a monogamous relationship we'll say. So I needed to find an expression uh, that was pluralistic, uh, that was interfaith, that was interspiritual, that was integrative, uh, that, was, that was integral. I was a student of integral spirituality, uh, all the way, extending all the way back to Sri Aurobindo uh, in the 1930s, and all the way up through Arthur Kessler and Michael Murphy and Alan Watts and and Ken Wilber in the 90s, and everybody that, you know, and John Gebser, and everybody who uh, has written about uh, this expression of spirituality that is integrative. Uh, and so I, what I did was uh, set up an integral church, what I called an integral church, uh, here in St. Pete, and we started out very small. Uh, we started out with meetings in my living room, uh, and I want to say there were probably about five of us to begin with. Uh, we sat around and we talked about religion and we talked about spirituality and we talked about church. We talked a lot about church. We talked about what we didn't like about church and we talked about what we did like about church. And we kind of chose what we wanted to keep and what we wanted to improve upon. And we also chose what we wanted to set aside and leave behind. And so we chose to meet in a circle and we chose to meet outside. Uh, it started three years ago in a city park here in St. Pete. Uh, we were meeting once a month. Uh, that has now increased in frequency. We've added a service, an indoor service at a chapel uh, nearby. And so we're meeting twice a month for services, for interfaith services. And we now also have a book club uh, that meets monthly, as well as an ecstatic dance group. Uh, where we celebrate quarterly on the solstice and the equinox. We do uh, sacred drumming and ecstatic dance. Uh, we also have various workshops that we offer, either on world religions or integral spirituality or relationships, like the one that is happening this weekend uh, that my wife and I are co-facilitating. So there's a kind of a full spectrum of offerings, all the way ranging from spiritual community uh, up to intellectual discussion and conversation uh, and into personal transformative practice and uh, spiritual development. And so in addition to kind of the core offerings that, that make up the mission and the, and the, and the purpose of the church, we also do two big annual events uh, every year. One of them is called Alchemy Fest. Uh, it's based on uh, the, the, the theme of alchemy being transformation. Uh, it's also the name of my daughter. My daughter's name is Alchemy. And so it started 11 years ago uh, as her birthday party uh, at a very small <laughs> uh, event over in Tampa. And it's since outgrown my daughter. Uh, I want to say 
it's probably for the best because now the thing has 40 local vendors that come with tents and we have a food food area and food trucks and we have art and two stages of live music and yoga and meditation and massage and it's basically like a a spiritual fair if you will uh that happens in april uh right around the um the equinox and easter so that's one of the events that we do every year and the other event that we do that started three years ago is called interfaith week so it's a citywide initiative to get all the leaders of faith communities around a table together for discussion uh, getting faith leaders in a room together uh, with people they normally wouldn't hang out with, uh, having conversations they normally wouldn't have, ideally in a peer-to-peer -peer setting. You know, some of them are panel discussions. Some of them are uh, workshops, and, and very few of them are keynotes or lectures. We really try to have it be a community dialogue uh, with the leaders and ask them the big questions about how these communities can get along and how they can lead by example by stepping into the room with one another. Uh, the other thing that happens during Interfaith Week is we encourage people to visit these other communities, visit these sister communities, and explore how the other people in our communities worship or what we call celebrate the sacred. And so Interfaith Week uh, has gotten the support uh, of the mayor uh, here in St. Petersburg. I actually ran into him in the line at Best Buy while we were checking out some computer equipment. And, you know, he happens to be a Jewish mayor on a Christian, majority Christian city council. Uh, he's uh, married to, uh, his wife is Catholic. And so he's also in an interfaith marriage. And so He's, you know, reminding the council members every time there's a prayer at the beginning of a meeting that, you know, there's a there's a Jewish guy in the room. So uh, anything that we can do in our community to further and promote interfaith dialogue, he is 100% supportive of. We've got a proclamation from him two years in a row, uh, and the city has been behind us for Interfaith Week now. So that's been a great a great help in getting the word out uh, to the communities as well. So. Those are some of the things that I'm involved in and some of the ways, I think, just to kind of kick off the conversation, because what I want to talk about tonight and what I want to learn from all of you uh, are ways that we grow, uh, something as small as five people in a living room uh, gathered together for uh, either a Bible study or an interfaith study group or a home church. Uh, how do we grow that into people who really want to commit to a very specific mission or cause, uh, people who want to commit to spreading interfaith dialogue or a message of interspirituality um, around a core message? And sometimes that means establishing either a steering committee or a board of directors, and how do you go about selecting those people? I know for me that in the beginning it was whoever would show up uh, that was good enough for me. And now three years later, I have some very committed people on the board. The board has changed every year, and I now finally have some very committed people on the board uh, that I'm just so proud of. Uh, I'm proud to be able to call them team members uh, in supporting this mission. And it's really our mission now, not just my pipe dream. Uh, so that's been exciting. And then beyond the board of directors, how do you grow this group if you're doing weekly uh, services, how do you grow weekly congregations, monthly congregations, how are you getting the word out to the wider community? And so I've got some tips and some tools, obviously, that I use, like, you know, public relations and, and my experience in the private sector as a marketing director at a media company and, and using things like Gmail and Google Docs to their full advantage to leverage contact and reaching out to the press and um, you know, doing events that the community cares about, i.e. Interfaith Week or Alchemy Fest, uh, as well as doing the smaller, kind of more intimate uh, and meaningful things like the interfaith services and like the spiritual development program. So uh, if anybody has anything to share, I would love to hear from you. So raise your hand in the social webinar or press 1 on your keypad on your phone 
uh, to raise your hand if you've got something that you'd like to share with the group about how you have grown and leveraged your community from a seed, from a tiny little seedling into maybe 10 people or how you've grown 10 people into 100 people. Uh, if you've got anything you'd like to share, please go ahead and raise your hand. And then the uh, other thing that uh, I think we should probably talk about is the um, frustration. I think that, you know, if I can share personally the frustration that we have in growing what's considered an interfaith and interspiritual community, uh, when you have so many uh, voices or people uh, at the table, uh, the fact that when we meet, we meet in a circle, uh, you know, for, so for us, there's no back pew, right? For when you come into one of our services, uh, there's no way to just kind of hang in the back and, and just be curious and observe. Uh, there's a circle of chairs, or in the case of the outdoor service, there's a circle of people on a blanket on the ground, and you are forced to sit down with us and, and just become part of the experience. And so it's been fun and interesting uh, to see the turnover uh, in the people who come in, because I think as interfaith ministers, as leaders of any community, uh, we're definitely seeing that the language we use, uh, the expressions that we use in spirituality tends to land and be heard differently by different people. I'm a big student, you know, coming from the integral spirituality tradition. I am a big student of spiral dynamics. And so when there are, say, let's say a Wiccan or a Pagan in the circle, uh, and we're talking about using tr some more tribal-based language, um, sometimes that conflicts with or has trouble kind of keying in with uh, somebody who's at a more traditional, say, Catholic, a recovering Catholic who's there uh, seeking new spiritual community, or say somebody who's a Buddhist um, who uh, doesn't really have a sense of theology. Uh, we're trying to square the language we're using. And uh, also, there are atheists in the circle as well at any given moment. And uh, people who are there for the sense of community uh, and to try to uh, be there for the intellectual engagement and the intellectual discussion. And so all this language and, and the experience ultimately has to be framed uh, to hold everybody at once. And so I'm sure everybody being interfaith ministers has experienced that kind of uh, plate spinning, we'll call it, or having to keep everybody in safe space, sacred space together at once. And uh, I'd be interested in hearing some best practices about that. I see that Nell has her hand up, so let's go ahead and unmute Nell. Uh, uh, Nell has to, uh, there you go. Nell, are you there? I am. I have a question for you. Um, what I heard you describe was uh, a series of dialogues uh, as you were starting up around uh, church, what people liked, what they, they didn't like, what uh, you wanted to incorporate and what you set aside, and that kind of conversation. And uh, that's a very creative and engaging kind of conversation uh, for a startup. But so my question is, once you've gone through those conversations and you've made some choices, and then you have new people joining in, um, how do you keep the conversation alive? How do you keep um, incorporate uh, the new people's um, in, in that, con that rich conversation that you had and not just become another flavor of church that they have to fit into? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I want to say to some extent we, we try to keep the conversation open with people coming into the circle in that we've now opened it up for a little more sharing and hearing from uh, people, we have a, a tradition we call the offering of the stones. And so it's kind of like a talking stick or a taze tradition or in UUism, it's the um, joys and concerns uh, and the lighting of the candle. But we, we ask people to bring a stone uh, with them to each service and then in holding that stone and offering it to the collection, we've got a nice big kind of 
picture, uh, like a planter box that holds the stones now, um, in offering their stones to the collection, that's their opportunity to kind of celebrate something that month or that week or ask for prayer or meditation support from the group. Uh, that experience, that sharing in the beginning of service has turned into a real cornerstone of the experience. And that is where I think we hear from people who are on their different spiritual paths. Uh, they hear, we hear a lot of gratitude for the opportunity to be in a circle like the one we have, to be able to share the way they do. Uh, we also hear uh, a lot about what people are spe uh, seeking specifically. And while we haven't really changed the, the flow of the service drastically or dramatically in the last two years, I want to say, we have added things. I used to do a section where we would do silent or uh, affirmations in unison. Uh, that kind of fell by the wayside when we discovered it was just kind of redundant with a, another piece, like a moment of silence we were doing. And so we're always kind of tailoring the service to, to fit, right, to, to, to feel out what's appropriate or, you know, when we hear, uh, you know, I'm always hanging around and talking to people intimately afterward and, I'm, you know, I'm always asking for feedback. I'm asking if people want to be a musical guest or lead the guided meditation or even be a guest speaker. You know, it's, it's a very peer-to-peer, -peer, right? It's a very, very inward-facing and postmodern. So it maintains that element of, you know, um, the voices around the table, but it definitely has, as you say, taken shape. Like it has a shape now, um, but does continue to adapt. You know, maybe slowly, more slowly now than it did in the beginning. Um, but that's only because, like you said, we've got a handbook now that's printed and, and we've got, you know, sections of our service up online. And so it is becoming kind of a, a structure now. Uh, that would be slower to adapt now if if need be. So you're right. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And and I I appreciate your response. And and uh, I just like to say that this is um, a challenge for all of us. I think to be a, continue to be aware of um, that. Uh, Perhaps we build into our quote unquote structure um, ways of uh, providing input or ways of uh, flexibility. Um, like one of the things that we did in our group is that we rotate, or not rotate, we um, provide the opportunity for people to volunteer to facilitate a meeting. And so every time there's a new facilitator, they have the opportunity to bring in their favorite thing. And so there's a structure and there's the opportunity for individual input into, um, into that. So I think, uh, in my view, I want to continue to be very mindful about um, not becoming too rigid or, or ritualistic in, in the structures and to keep that creative uh, flow uh, in what we do. Yeah, and you know, I agree with you. And I think that um uh Susan, I see your hands up, we'll get to you in a second. I, I think that um you know, it's okay to have structure. And I, you know, this is my opinion. I think it's okay to have structure. I think it's okay to have a little bit of rigidity because I think when you go to a service or a gathering or a meeting or an, a, any any experience like that and it's so different from week to week and there's inconsistency, I think that can be a little off-putting too. And so I think it's okay to have a little bit of structure and consistency, but I think it's more important to have, to have a real clear expectation around the idea that it's, what we're doing isn't hierarchical, it's holarchical, right? And that anybody can enter this circle at any time and step up and be a leader or a facilitator or play a part. Play a, you know, in any ritual, there needs to be tiers or levels of engagement. And so it needs to be real clear that anybody at any time can step into the circle and be as engaged as they want. And that can include, like you said, being a facilitator. It's just, it's just what we want to distinguish is the fact that it's not hierarchical and that there's not one person. I've been in the church experience so often where the congregation is giving feedback on what they want and what they'd like to see, and it's just, it always falls on deaf ears, right? I've been in that situation more than once where 
you know, even on the administrative level where I'm doing the marketing for a church and I'm, I'm, I'm entering the surveys, right? I'm, keep, I'm reading the survey results and I see what the people want, but maybe church management isn't interested in, you know, in changing or they've just done something for so long or, you know, like Carl said, it's maybe it's a more structured, uh, more structured religion that if changing an element of, um, of worship is just, it's maybe not an option for them. So, yeah, thank you, Nell. Uh, let's hear from Susan. Susan's got her hand up. Hi there. Susan, hey, you- yeah, I didn't want ah. you to rush. I loved that conversation. Oh, Very rich. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did, well, sorry for being late. Uh, interesting uh, happenings over here. But anyway, um, I would like to say that our church began in uh, late 60s um, as an offshoot or an experiment from, um, I forget what group, I always call it Methodist, I think it's a different one, a Reformed something or other, but a very, you know, a much more Christian uh, uh, establishment. But it was an experiment to see if people would want to look into something different than the traditional uh, worship services for services and be open and of course it's the 60s and uh, so it was a bunch of hippies every once in a while you would smell funny smells people smoking certain things but, <laughs> but it was it wasn't the fr- uh, when, what, pardon me it wasn't the frankincense it was it was not quite the frankincense I I I kind of recognize it, but eh, maybe it was sage. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, one of the things that he was charged with was, you know, to really just embrace this something different. And he really wasn't quite sure what he wanted, but he started to talk about the different faiths and more spirituality. And um, he uh, came, he started to make his plans and thought about what he was doing, thought he might be a failure and, and thought, looking at this neighborhood it was it looked conservative maybe but he just thought he'd go forward and he put flyers out in the entire neighborhood all over the town as much as he possibly could and he said well you know look if one person comes i'll feel good and they were overflowing that particular sunday because so many people were looking for something that was a little different that was new to them and i i believe it was just called pebble hill church at that point um, and it was probably about, I want to say, 15 to 20 years later that, um, you know, this guy had left maybe after 18 years, and another one started a few years later. And he was embracing, and this was in the 70s-ish, late 70s, where he started to uh, – no, 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 I'm guessing it was 80s now that I'm thinking of it um, – where he started to hear about this interfaith movement. And uh, he saw that – well, why don't I just bring in a little bit about Islam, or a little bit about Judaism, and how about a person come and talk about it? And and so he really uh, started to make the change for interfaith, and kind of answers a lot of what it is that you're you're saying, Nell, in uh, that in that what do we do when people are starting to change, and what do we do when people want something different? And it is it can be organically changing. Uh, this church has now. Been in what's 68, 70, 80, 90, so like what, almost 50 years or so. Um, and so we've gone through so many changes where it was mostly kids and families, and then it was mostly uh, elderly, and then, you know, so we're going through another change. And um, right now we have the seminary, and um, we have to go back in. We have town meetings, much like you were talking about, during the uh uh, where we would look, we try and have those pretty often and not often enough sometimes. And there is anger. There is people pitted against each other that, you know, people just end up not liking it, leaving or coming back or uh, other people coming for a certain amount of time. It's just the flow of this kind of a, of a situation. Um, and I loved your story, Jordan, about, you know, wh- how it is that it's, it's happening in just a few years, which is pretty much what, how you got to just trust. And, you know, anything that you try, uh, somebody wants to talk about, um, 
you know, the Rosicrucians, and I really like to have such and such, you know, can we really do that? Well, you try it for a while, and then if it doesn't seem to work at that particular point, it doesn't mean that it's not, it didn't work. It just means you put it on the back burner, okay, maybe we'll try this in another year or five years. Because I, from what I can see about the history of Pebble Hill Church, that is what has happened. And uh, then there is a psychic group that comes on one, the Wednesday, uh, first Wednesday of every month. There's another group that does uh, Course in Miracles, uh, you know, a certain. So it's not all just about that Sunday thing. It's lots of different, let's say, committees or groups. It's growing, just constantly growing and changing. Um, and uh, and it's all about interfaith now. And then we do have services about, you know, Ramadan, about, uh, you know, for, this, for Easter, uh, all of the holidays for Christmas time, you know, you have all, uh, you know, Hanukkah, everything. And uh, so we just celebrate them all. And then any different spiritualities. And we really try and bring in, you know, even Native American, we bring in speakers to speak about things that people are looking to hear about. So it so it continues. Yeah, and so it unfolds exactly. Can you spell the name of your church for me? You say Pebble Hill. Pebble Hill, P E B B L E, and then second word uh-huh. Hill, H I L L, and it okay. is um, an inter it is an interfaith church right now. That's great. Yeah, it hurts my heart, you know, to to think about and see. I see them all over, um, and I work with them. The churches who or any community who, is, who has a facility that is up and running on Sunday for one or two services, and then maybe on a Wednesday or Thursday for an AA meeting or something, and then it just com- lays completely dark for the rest of the week. You know, and it's just, it's such a waste to me. You know, there's so, there's so many, when you think about the, the violence and the hate speech and the prejudices and racism and issues around culturally and spiritually and religiously and LGBT issues, all of these things that these community conversations that need to happen. Somebody needs to convene the community around these conversations and these rooms where spiritual leaders could really be leading the charge on this stuff. These rooms are just sitting dark. You know, it just, it, it hurts me sometimes to, to think about the lost potential and the years that, you know, that we have to make up. And the other thing that uh, I thought when you, um, when you were talking about people on, you know, growing, people growing, you know, and meeting their needs, I think that we really do need to take into consideration the fact that religion and spirituality is one of the few things that doesn't allow for maturity, for people to change, right? And Bishop Spong writes a lot about this and about, well, the church doesn't want you to grow up, right? The church wants to continue to tell you what to do and what to think. It, it doesn't want you to be an adult or to mature. Um, you know, and, and, and he has an idea that that's the whole idea behind being born again is to always stay with the, the mind of a child and that kind of thing. And he's got a, a specific bias against that tradition and some of that language. And I understand that. But really, just kind of objectively, religion and spirituality is one of the very few traditions that doesn't allow for people to kind of unfold and expand and grow. With other structures, educational institutions and, you know, artistic institutions, any other structure allows you to excel, become better, to consider more than one perspective, to grow in the way that you're interpreting or understanding or, you know, this information is being revealed or taught. Um, Religion just kind of has this ceiling, right? It has this ceiling that you can't break through because as you move from, let's say, for example, uh, Judaism to the more mystical form, say the Kabbalah, well, then you have to go to a different place to learn about the Kabbalah. If you're in Islam and you want to learn about Sufism, which is the mystical form of Islam, you have to go somewhere else to be a Sufi. And if you're a Christian and you want to learn about, you know, Gnosticism or metaphysical Christianity or, you know, new thought, things like this. Those are completely other systems and structures that you have to leave the building to go experience. And so it seems to me that religion can do a better job of kind of being a, a vessel and a, and, a, and a something to catch and hold these people who are maturing in their way of spiritual expression uh, and providing something 
in a way of community where people can continue to connect and continue to learn and continue to stay in their faith tradition, uh, but experience it and interpret it a little more broadly. Susan, you have your hand up again. Let's hear from you. Uh, yes, um, you know, uh, I also wanted to, uh, you, you sparked me uh, into something more. I'm very lucky to live in the Philadelphia area where we do have a Philadelphia interfaith um, uh, group, I don't know, organization. We also have many, many um, groups that are into peace and organizing together, working all the different uh, churches together. Um, and uh, we just, I'm going to say a year ago, we had a group, uh, a gathering. We just didn't realize that it was on the day when there was what was called the interfaith walk. And so this year we want to be a part of that um, because we would really like to interconnect and uh, really see what else is out there and how. But, uh, you know, check anybody who is in a, a larger city or area and wants to connect uh there are lots in, in just in my Philadelphia area and even the surrounding area so check your you know your surrounding areas maybe there are some other um larger groups that you could you know work with if you're just starting your own group out you you're creating it Jordan but um you know um uh, wanted to throw that out there thanks yeah absolutely thank you uh, and I agree. I've got I've got a board member uh, who specifically, when she came on board, uh, said I will I will be a part of this as long as you understand that I will push you and continue to push you, meaning me, uh, to get out out of your comfort zone and continue to go out in the community and connect with these other faith leaders because it's important to get around the table with a rabbi and an imam and a pastor and have a conversation. Uh, so much can be learned in those moments. Uh, it's, 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 it's inexplicable. It's indescribable. And as leaders of community, it's not just about comparing notes and talking shop and, you know, and getting in a room. It's, it's really, the, the, there's a sense of orientation that happens when you get in the room with these people. And there's a sense of, you, you know, I think it was Raymond Panikar who said that you have to go, come through a specific faith tradition in order to be fully engaged in interfaith dialogue. Uh, because what happens is that your own faith deepens uh, when you get around these other traditions. And that really is the case. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful uh, to the support of my board and the people around me who have continued to push me uh, though I might fight kicking and screaming at the time, uh, it's really worth it uh, when you get out in the community and you start to connect and you start to see these connections and these seeds that you plant uh, come to fruition and really, really pay off. So let's hear from some other people. Uh, do, does anybody have any questions uh, related to anything else that was said or have any feedback on what's been said so far? Claudia, you've got your hand up. <laughs> Why don't we hear from you? Thank you, Joran. And, you know, I was looking back at, at, at what people had, had wanted to talk about or wanted some information on in this call. And uh, as I was looking back on that, I saw that quite a few people wanted to know, how do you get the word out? Um, what, would, what would be the, you know, the best way to get the word out that you are forming this community and and how do you reach the right people? Um, so you being a marketing person, maybe, and, and, and any other people who are marketing people, if there are any, yeah, Tammy is too, um, right. how, how, how do you get the word out about it and, and attract the right people? That's my sure. question. Okay, yeah, it's a really good question. And in core to, to why we're here tonight having this specific uh, discussion. So, I mean, I'll just start with describing some of the tools that, that, that they're at everybody's disposal. Uh, everybody has an email account. Uh, if you didn't have an email account, you couldn't be on this call. So everybody has an email account, and you've got probably at least 50 people in your address book that you could invite to something that you threw together uh, that would probably be interested in an interfaith experience or an interspiritual experience. 
uh, whatever you choose to call it, whatever you choose to, you know, whatever language you choose. And then the second thing would be, well, let's stay on tools for a while because there's what, Facebook, there's Google+, Plus, there's Twitter, uh, there's even Instagram, and now there's Snapchat, and there's YouTube, and there are so many tools now at our disposal to get the word out about what we're doing. Uh, me coming from a background in media and marketing, um, it is it, admittedly it's second nature for me to write a blog post, uh, shoot a little video on my phone, upload it to YouTube, embed that video in the blog post so that I can not only share the blog post on Facebook, but also embed the video on Facebook and share the content kind of separately and then together in one format and then tease it out to Twitter and to the other formats as well. And then all the while growing your email list, right? So you've got a weekly or monthly email newsletter that goes out to continue to grow this audience around whatever it is you're doing. All those tools aren't worth a thing unless you're not using the right language to connect with the people who receive it along the touch point that you're reaching them at. So I would say whatever your experience is, is, is that you're building, whether it's an interfaith or interspiritual experience or whether it's a new age experience or whether it's pluralistic or it's a community discussion about spiritual topics, you know, get really clear about what it is you're doing and then get really skilled at describing it. You know, you've got to describe it in language that lands with people and lands with them in a way that, you know, it, it makes, lets them know that you're there for them. You're providing an experience for them that they might be looking for. And so you want to, for me, uh, it was using words like postmodern, you know, to appeal to maybe the more intellectual segment of you know, the audience or the, you know, my followers on Facebook or whatever. It was using words like green uh, to describe some of the initiatives and some of the projects we were working on. In the beginning, we were involved with, you know, potentially starting up a community garden, like an urban farming initiative. And we were using words like green and organic and local and words that would resonate with people and that, you know, hey, this is something, these are values that are in line with, the way I live my life, the way I want to raise my family, the way I see myself growing and connected to my community, maybe the political causes that I'm involved in. So using language that really connects with people. Uh, you know, it could be, you know, Wiccan. It could be around A Course in Miracles. It could be around angels. It could be around metaphysics. It could be around any of this language, but get really good at describing it, but also how it's different from something that's already out there, right? So if you're something, if you're providing some kind of metaphysical Christian experience, you're going to really need to make a, a clear differentiation between how is your church different from uh, something in new thought, religious science, Christian science, unity, because these are structures that are out there in the world already that are already fulfilling a need for people, a spiritual need for people. And so if what you're providing is really close to that, you're going to have to get good at describing how it's different. Uh, and then the third thing I think would be once people do show up, just really engaging them, um, providing an experience that is authentic, uh, open, and honest, and being honest with people, um, if they're in the room with you and they uh, feel a connection uh, to, to you or to one another or to spirit in that moment, uh, those, those are the moments in building spiritual community that we're all seeking, right? And so in my case, that's why I needed to build my own, is to create those moments outside of a system or structure. And those moments are happening now with regularity. We just need to come uh, work to keep them authentic and open and inward facing and continue to hear from people, hear them, what they, what they love about it, what they'd want to see different about it, uh, really keeping your lines of communication open with people. And, uh, and I think that what, what you'll see is that you'll, you'll grow from five to 10 to 100 relatively quickly. Uh, Claudia, I see you've got your hand up again. Do you have another question? I don't have another question, but I do have a comment. And yeah. my comment is um, that I think that when you are when you are fashioning your 
um, your statement or uh, the marketing to put out there. You know, I started out being, I live in a very conservative community, and I started out um, trying to speak to people um, how do I say? with words that um, would appeal to this conservative space, okay? But sure. I soon realized, though, that 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 wasn't really who I who I am. Right. And so when I started to speak to people from my truth, and when I started fashioning my marketing with my truth, now you know now I'm getting um, I'm getting the people that. Uh, connect with that and resonate with that. Yeah. And so I think it's important that we uh, remember that when we're, when we're putting things out. Uh, you know, don't, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't put things out there that you think people want to hear. Put things out that, that come from your heart. Yeah. Then yeah, and, and, I'm and, I, and I would don't, don't put something out there that maybe you can't fulfill or deliver on as well. You know, it might be, it might be an instance where uh, you're using specific words or language to, you know, maybe target a segment of the community because you know that there are a bunch of um, Catholics or Methodists or whoever that, you know, are just dying for new community. Maybe there was a recent uh, decision uh, at a level where uh, leadership decided to uh, maybe get behind a political initiative or a social cause that uh, caused a split or a schism in the church, and you just know that there's a bunch of people out there looking for a, maybe a more open or welcoming community, right? And you think you can provide that. So in that instance, it's okay to put a message out that, there that you know will target those people to say, come on in, and, you know, are you looking for a church that's a little more open? Are you looking for a spiritual community that's a little more welcoming? Come down on Wednesday nights and, and you know, and give us a try. Come come hang out with us and see what you think. You know, it's okay to, to use uh, some language to target those people. But, yeah, it, it's got to be authentic. It's got to be in your own voice. You know, it can't. You, it can't sound like a commercial. You know, it can't sound like somebody else wrote it for you. Uh, does anybody uh, – oh, Tammy, Tammy, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention a couple other uh, possibilities in the marketing and advertising and, and PR realm. Um, something that that I came across a couple years ago is called Meetup, and I think it's dot com. Uh, yep. But it's a yep. great resource for for posting uh, get-togethers. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, gatherings going on out there on on different topics, and um, I thought I thought that I would throw that out there because if if you're thinking about starting up uh, something right from the ground, it might be a, a good um, option to to go with. Also, there are uh, in uh, certain communities, I believe, there are free um, publications. The one that I'm familiar with here in Michigan is called Natural Awakenings. I think that's the name of it. Uh, but yeah, it's distributed yeah. in 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 uh, towns and cities. You can spot it here and there. And it's got a, a spiritual twist to it. 
and you can I think that you can post in the back of that for free, but there are also opportunities to announce um, anything that's happening, any events that are happening in the area. Uh, and I don't know if that costs anything, but it's probably just minimal. Uh, and it might be a good way to reach your your market that way too. So uh, just a couple things that came to my mind that I thought I would share. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, all the both great ideas. Uh, National Awakenings is solid, and I would add too. You know, I'm a little biased because I work for an alternative news weekly. I work for Creative Loafing, which has papers in Tampa and Sarasota and Charlotte and Atlanta. Um, but there are alternative news weeklies in some of the larger metropolitan areas, like say the Village Voice in New York or the Philadelphia City Paper, or things like that. That you know, it's not the Daily Paper; it's usually the alternative to the Daily Paper. Uh, that's usually more liberal and uh, includes events uh, that you know people who would be down with what you're doing would probably be reading. So um, those alternative news weeklies are always a, a, another good outlet if you're trying to advertise in print. And then I would also add that going out to events, you know, I mentioned we do a couple big events per year, but we're also out at other people's events. So we've got a 10 by 10 tent and we've got a banner, you know, a little, you know, 10 foot banner that we zip tie up and a little table with some brochures and, and we're out talking to people and we're out at these events alongside uh, the Atheists of Florida and Shambhala Meditation Center and the Quakers and, you know, at some of these events, we're not the only, uh, we're definitely not the only nonprofit on the ground and, and we're most times not the only church on the ground either or spiritual community on the ground. And so we're out there talking about what we do. And those are really fun events because not only do you get to kind of network with the atheists and the Quakers and the whoever else is out there, but you also get to, you get really good really fast at telling somebody what it is you're doing uh, and why they should care about it. And so I would recommend uh, getting out into the community, even if it's standing on a street corner. I know you hate to be that corner preacher, uh, but even if it is just getting out in front of a coffee shop one day and handing out a couple of flyers about a meeting that you're having and just getting good at getting your, you know, what, what's called your, eleva your elevator pitch down and being able to describe in two or three sentences uh, what it is that you're doing, uh, what it is that you're trying to grow, what is your specific purpose, your cause in the world, right? What are you trying to provide in the world that's different uh, from what's already there? So uh, any of those things can be a great exercise as well as uh, a way to grow the community itself. Uh, we've seen, uh, I've had, a, I've found a board member uh, through meetup.com. It was actually the only person that came in all year through meetup, through our meetup account, uh, but she became a board member. And uh, events, I can't tell you how many emails we get uh, when we go out and have a table at these community events, like the we have the Quakers do the Circus McGurkis. We have a local business organization that does something called Local Topia, where it's thousands of people, uh, and we have a booth there. There's many events that you can be at, I'm sure. You might have to, you know, if you're in a really small little hamlet, you might have to travel a little bit to, uh, to get to some of these larger events, but it's definitely worth it. Uh, anybody else have any uh, questions? or um, comments or feedback on what's, or thoughts on what's been discussed so far. Go ahead and throw your hand up. We'll wait a little bit. I'm sure there's some people who are, they have a question that's forming. <laughs> but they're just, not quite there yet with raising their hand. I'll wait for you. Um, I would like to, let's see, I think it was, was it Kat, was it Kate who was doing the work with the, um, the senior communities? Um, maybe somebody can help me remember. Maybe it was Kate. 
I'd like to ask her a little bit about that. Kate, was that you? Yes. Was that you that was yes. trying to um, start up a ministry? And can you tell us a little bit about that? Um. I, I've worked in nursing homes like all my life, so like all my adult life, so that's over 30 years. And um, more and more, I find I'm drawn towards the where they are religiously and spiritually. So I uh, pursued chaplaincy, and on route to that, I'm also pursuing interfaith ministry just to be able to really connect with the different faith systems I've been meeting along the way. So what I was hoping to do was to take all of this and um, start up very specific specific spiritual programming in the different nursing homes in my area that, you know, go past, you know, many nursing homes think as long as they offer the Christian service and the the Jewish service, they're done. (laughs) They've done their work, yeah. and I, I find that that is really not the fact and that the elders are very curious about conversations around what they believe. Right. So I don't know yet what it looks like, uh, so I'm looking for any and all information I can gather to see what this ministry will look like. Well, I think it, 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 it just stuck out in my mind, and I wanted to ask you that because what, what strikes me in my community is the, the really, really rich and meaningful value that comes when you, um, when you create some kind of intergenerational uh, experience or service mm-hmm. or ritual. Um, and I think it's really important to, yeah, not only understand that these people, these human beings are not aging out of their spirituality. Uh, it's not like a bracket. You know, like their 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 spirituality is deepening. You know, yeah. as they as they continue to unfold the, the conversations they want to continue to have, uh, in some cases. And I think what might be really cool is to get some young people in the room with them and have those conversations. Yeah. You know? Because it might not be the the members of their own family that want to enter into that conversation. But I tell you, there's there's ten college college students. Uh, who would love to be in the room with them and hear their story. You know what I mean? So yeah. that no, could be that's fun. great. No, that's great. I mean, one of the things I've been doing with them is having a, once or twice a month a program called What We Believe and bringing in different faith practices and discussions around them. And I have brought in a couple of students from the neighborhood college to talk about their, their faith. And uh, and it's been really rich listening to the elders engage them in conversation and curiosity around that and become more um, open to to other faith systems as a result. Yeah. Yeah, those oh, thank you. are that's so magical. That's a great idea. Yeah, uh, so special. Okay. Thank so, you. Claudia, I yeah, absolutely. Uh, Claudia, I want to ask you kind of uh, how we're doing on time. Do you think it's time to go around and do our checkout? I've kind of not been We've got, the clock. Yeah, we have about uh, 15 minutes left to go. So okay. um, Let's do that might, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, then what, since I have you, then why don't we start with you? Let's go around and have everybody um, – say something that they loved about the call uh, and then say something that they would uh, change about the call. And then lastly, uh, what they're going to carry from the call uh, out into, uh, into their own lives or practice. Why don't you go first? Oh, you want me to go first? Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, what I loved about the call was um, hearing the experiences of other ministers and um, and what they hope to build. Um, what I would like to change about the call, I'm not sure there's anything I do would like to change, except maybe to be... Um, 
a little more mindful of um, the request from the beginning and um, what was the third part? What I love. Oh, what you? Oh, what I'll carry forward. Um, you know the the. the comment that Kathleen talked about and you talked about in terms of bringing in younger people to be with the older people, um, it's interesting because in the in the group that Tammy and I do here, it's about half and half. And the intergenerational conversations and wisdom is, is just wonderful. And um, I learned so much from from the young, and they are eager to hear from us too. And so I would I would love to see more ministries delve into that. And I am going to see what I can do about um, you know expanding that both in a, in a local level and online. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's hear from Rosemary. Rosemary, are you there? Uh, which one, me? Yes, you. I'm, I'm one of them. I couldn't figure out how to get online, so I haven't... Downloading everything, and I never figured it out, so I haven't heard all of it. Oh, okay. Well, uh, if you want to comment on what you've heard at all, uh, this is your opportunity to say what you liked and what you'd change and then maybe what you'll carry forward. Well, mostly I have heard the comments. Okay. How can I comment on the comments? I don't know how to comment on comments. It's okay. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. Uh, but we thank you for being here. And let's go to Susan. Susan, you want to say what you love and what maybe what you change and what you carry forward? Sure. Um, I love that it, that this uh, uh, conversation has begun um, because it's so rich. There's, I think, one could. Well, I love it because I love faith and I love the idea of. Uh, bringing people into new things. What uh, what would I change? Uh, is my own time uh, uh, <laughs> to get here on time and to be able to uh, have have more time. But uh, um, you know, just more interaction. And I know a lot of people are kind of quiet uh, so many times. So it'll be fun to hear more of what people think. And what I will take with me is really uh, uh, all that you actually put forth there. I really love your story. Um, because it really does fit in with what it is I've been doing and what it is that I love. So um, I just like like it getting bigger. So thank you very much for everything. Thank you, thank you Susan. I appreciate that. Uh, and Charles, uh, Charles, can we hear from you? Oh, uh, I enjoyed hearing the comments of how everybody uh, is working on their different projects, and and I can learn from that. Um, I don't know what to change. The the, uh, the thing that that's bothering me is I'm I'm starting to get tired of doing so much work, and and here you come up with more ideas of more work. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, stay strong, stay strong, with uh, it, It's hard. Yes. I know, I know it is. I know it is, and hopefully that this call can be, you know, can feed you in a way to keep you inspired, to keep you motivated. Hopefully next month's call will just put a little more fire in you. I need it. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, thank you, Charles. Uh, Josie, what about you? Um, yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Are you good? Okay, good. Um, what I loved about the call was just the um, open dialogue and everybody getting a chance to talk and share. Um, what I would like to change 
set up the phone call is to uh, have it early in the evening. Um, Nine o'clock comes and I'm done. Um, so, but I know that people in California and it's much earlier than five o'clock didn't work. So I set the drink for two. Um, and then what I'm going to forward. I I want to get the word out, you know, that angel card messages. And um I'm not trying to grow the ministry as much, but I just want to help people grow spiritually. And and I know about all the marketing tools, the email, the Facebook, the stuff dot com. I think what I just need to do is just be a little bit more disciplined and work a little harder on these types of uh, tools to get the word out so that I can help more people. Well, yeah, no, Josie, I wouldn't say work harder. I would say work smarter. You know, maybe you just need to, if you're starting out with social media or trying to work it into your daily routine and it's a, it's a lot to confront, uh, you know, maybe just set aside 10 minutes a day, just like you would a meditation or a prayer practice, you know, just set aside 10 minutes a day to hop on Facebook or Twitter or whatever and, you know, comment on some things and see what other people are doing and make a post and, you know, don't, don't put so much pressure on yourself, you know, it'll happen, it'll happen. All right. Very good. Thank you so much. That's good advice. Thank you, Josie. Uh, what about Richard? Richard, are you there? Yeah, I am. Um, but I, I, I really like that and appreciate a great deal this week is that, that you told your own story. Um, that was the pretty informative stuff there. Um, and, of course, it made the, the comment or as response to that story, that's richer. So I, I, I like that. I like that a lot. I don't think I change anything. Uh, and I think that it's kind of give me the impetus to go ahead and continue to do what it is that I'm doing. And it's just to share that I've decided to take the light from it, help them under the bed, put it on a lampstand. And it's just kind of motivation to continue to do that. Oh, I'm done. Oh, thank you, Richard. And Nell, Nell and Rick, let's hear from you guys. Yeah, the thing that I enjoyed uh, was hearing about your interfaith week and um, the citywide initiative to get the different ministers together and, and put on a, a series of events around that. And I think that's a an idea that uh, we'll want to uh, work with and, and try and see what uh, would work in the particular area that we're going into. And um, I also enjoyed hearing uh, somebody brought to mind the Native American aspect, uh, which there are, there are tribes in the area that we are, and I hadn't thought of including them. Uh, so that was an important addition to my thinking. And um, I appreciate it, and I uh, wouldn't change anything at this point. And for Rick, I really enjoyed your facilitation. Enjoyed it last time, enjoy it this time. And um, the one thing you, you mentioned with uh, even handing out flyers on a street corner, we've joked about that, and it's probably a good idea, so I'll ask Mel to do that, and I'll, I'll stay home. But... Uh, <laughs> That's about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Nell. Um, Kate, let's hear from you. Final checkout. Hi. Hi. So I guess what yeah. I, I really loved, I loved a lot about the conversation tonight. Um, really enjoyed hearing about the different interfaith communities that are out there and um, – you know, just the, that excitement to hear those the talks about how to grow those communities. Um, I'm also a member of, well, just recently joined an interfaith breakfast community in Queens where I live, and I'm kind of excited about bringing some of these ideas to that newly formed group, uh, especially like that interfaith week that you were talking about. Um, 
I guess the only challenge I had, something that was um, that I would like to change, is that I missed the first 30 minutes because I had such a difficult time hearing. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that you were trying to help me get connected. And um, I also appreciate whoever it is that's been typing all the conversations because I'm going to be able to catch up by reading all of that later. <laughs> um, as, as far as what I take with me, a uh, reminder of use of social media, especially meetup groups, which is a little bit alien to me, so that's something for me to explore. Um, and also just your most recent uh, mention of intergenerational opportunities. I do so much of that, but really looking at it from the spiritual uh, perspective and how can I make that happen. So thank you. This was a wonderful evening. Thank you, Kate. Uh, let's hear next from Ed. Ed, are you there? Uh, yes. Yes, I am. Um, I really like, uh, I'll take one thing, is I think that you, you are really bold and audacious starting starting like this week uh, celebration and everything you were talking about. So I think that you are thinking big, and I like that idea. Um, in terms of what I would change, maybe if you had some uh, links to resources or titles of useful books or something, that would be also like an addition to our conversation. That would be really good. And what I would take for myself would be, I'm very comfortable with the social media and everything, but I think your notion of going to events, being on street corners, being out there with people, um, I think that that's really something that I need to work on. And so I'm taking that um, from tonight's conversation along with all the other ideas. And thank you. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate that. Um, and it, right after we hear from everybody, I will uh, point you to a nice long list of links uh, that everybody can go visit. Um, first, though, let's hear from Sandra, uh, who is the person who has been diligently taking all those notes that will be sent out after the meeting. And uh, uh, we want to show some gratitude to her. And yeah, also uh, hear from her. Sandra, are you there? Hi, I am. And um, it's been a wonderful conversation. It's been my joy to try and capture what um, has been brought forth this evening. Um, I, I have just loved the sharing and the expansion of that. And, um, and I'm learned, I've learned a lot of things, learned a lot of things. And so like Kate, I'm going to take the notes, going to take the notes that I made and reread them so that I can integrate them just a little bit more. Um, and uh, also, uh, I, I'm glad that um, the idea of social media, uh, which I know to be a very important tool uh, for getting the word out, for hearing that reiterated. Um, and um, so that's probably my takeaway uh, is uh, just um, getting out personally to the different kind of events in my community or wherever kinds of groups of people uh, wind up being and simply sharing. Um, and it's just me by myself. So that's going to um, require some uh, kind of uh, getting myself up and ready and to go kind of energy. But, um, but I'm looking forward to experimenting and experiencing it all. And I am complete. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much. Uh, Tammy, are you, uh, uh, you want to be last? It looks like you're the last one. <laughs> I can be last. <laughs> um, well, I, I will say that um, I think what I loved about this uh, topic is, is that it was brought up and um, that we have so many people on it. It's good to know uh, that I, I'm I'm not alone in in how I think about things and and this has been a topic in the back of my mind for several years I guess ever since uh, ordination uh, but it was always the question how you know that's a that's a big undertaking and sometimes um, when it becomes so big uh, it never happens so taking um, you know a little bit at a time. Uh, is is better for me anyway, and and uh, that that would probably be uh, the biggest takeaway for me. 
uh, I also appreciated um, hearing you talk, Joran, about being clear on what my mission is. Uh, because I, I'm not sure that I am. So I think I will take some time to really uh, figure out what it is that I want to bring to the world and uh, then create that elevator speech. That That is a, another really good idea. And I love what Claudia said as well about speaking from your heart because I know I've talked with people who have uh, who who are are very clear about what they are here to do, and they do speak from their heart, and and I can feel that, um, opposed to somebody who doesn't speak from their heart, and I can also feel that. So um, I think that's a big part uh, that I will take away from this. And um, what I would change, I I'm not sure I would change anything. Uh, I, I wasn't able for some reason to get on the social webinar part of this. I kept getting an error, but I will look into that, see what happened there. But uh, other than that, it, it's been a, a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, everybody. I would like to just uh, kind of take a minute and have everybody and after we've done so much deep listening and sharing and connecting, everybody just take a deep breath in with me and let it out. Get comfortable wherever you're at, seated, standing, laying down. Some of you might be falling asleep wherever you are. I know it's late. You might be um, getting ready to relax completely. So just relax wherever you are. And just take a minute to connect with the intention of tonight. And that is the intention of growing, the intention of unfolding, the intention of holding more space for one another. Whether it's a larger world view, whether it's increased compassion, uh, whether it's an increased ability to listen or just to listen more effectively, we hold that here for one another tonight by connecting to each other, by sharing our values and our voice, by sharing in this experience, by allowing spirits to enter us here and act through us here and now in this moment, this beautiful, perfect moment of now and now. And we are grateful. And we say amen. And I'll close with my prayer from the integral tradition, which is, may our consciousness and our behavior be of benefit to all beings in all worlds, liberating all into the one taste of this and every moment. And so it is. Thank you and good night, good everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.